You know what the Giants did? You know what the Giants did? This is what they did. Took your advice? Hold on. No. Please. Hello all, welcome to another edition of the Citizen NFL Podcast. I'm Justin Ritzold, joined as always by Robert Harding and Chris Shearer. Indeed. How are you guys doing today? Excellent. Cold. Cold. And excellent. And cold. Well, and excellent. It is, it is winter in New York, so yeah. it comes with the territory, especially in this oh. building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially in this room. Yeah. For some reason, our conference rooms are basically like walk-in coolers. So I was going to hang up some meat in there, you know, just for the heck of it. Well, all right then. All right, Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully the room will warm up after some of Chris's hot takes. Mm-hmm. We're still recovering from the Odell Beckham thoughts last week. That's going to be yeah. tough to repeat, Chris. Oh, I I love challenges. <laughs> Wind me up and watch me go. All right. So, obviously, Monday Night Football, Bengals-Steelers, um, a hellacious game, to say the least. Um, just a bunch of ter- terrible plays. Uh, obviously, Ryan Shazier, Steelers linebacker, um, he actually just had a, a spinal surgery today. Mm-hmm. Um, he was down in the field for a little bit. Very scary injury on probably what was the most normal play out of all the big plays that happened that game. Um, Juju Smith-Schuster knocks out Vontez Perfect. He was suspended. Um, and then Antonio Brown got drilled in the head on a, a touchdown catch in the end zone by George Ioka. So, uh, first off, um, th- did you guys, because I know I kind of noticed myself doing this the past couple of years, but when there are those big, big hits in football now. Do you guys find yourself cringing a little bit? I think for me, it's just like you go, ooh, you know, like, wow. You know, he got lit up, man. I mean, that's that's pretty hard. Um, I, but I think with concussions and everything. But the thing is, you know it's illegal now. That's that's the biggest thing is that you know when you see a hit like that, you're going to see a flag soon after. And if your team is the perpetrator, you know that your team is going to be penalized. And, you know, like, there was a play last week with the Dolphins and the Broncos. It was third and long. Trevor Simeon throws a bad pass. The receiver can't get it. Incomplete. And then, like, about two or three seconds after the, the pass is incomplete, a Dolphins uh, defender comes in and, and lays a forearm to the guy and, and wallops him. And next thing you know, there comes the flag, 15 yards, automatic first down, sending getting the ball in the punt. The other team, you know, Denver keeps the ball and gets a first down. That's frustrating. Um, but you know the thing is, this is this is we know what the uh, after effects of some of these shots are to the head, and they've been out outlawed. And the players, I would like to think more than anybody else would know, don't aim for the head. Don't do these cheap shots. You can hit, you can hit hard and clean. Okay, I mean they give you the shoulder pads for a reason. Okay. I, I've said this before. I, I would hate to see this happen, but I have a feeling it's going to happen someday. But you're going to see a defender try to lay somebody out with a shot with his helmet, and he is going to be the one paralyzed because he decided to try to hit or lead with his head and his helmet. Well, and, that, and that's know. kind of what happened with Chazier. It's just it was yeah. based basically. Yeah. And you hate to say it because he's obviously in the hospital, right. but kind of poor. Poor technique leading right. with your helmet. And, and you don't know whether it was in, he was intentionally trying to lead with his head. I mean, it didn't. I saw the play. I mean, it's tough to tell whether he actually was trying to, you know, hit the guy with his helmet or he was like, you know, he was trying to go in and he got, you know, the guy's running and everything. It's kind of a moving target. So maybe he wasn't trying to lead with his head, but it just happened to fall that way. Um, but I'm telling you, someone is going to get crippled who's trying to lay out an illegal hit. And and I'm hoping that I hope it doesn't happen, but I think when it does, 
it's gonna it's gonna start a conversation that you know maybe you can't do this. You just you shouldn't be doing this with your head. You know you you don't. I mean, look, they have a sticker on the back of the helmet, and it says warning, and it, you know, and it says if you know you use this to try to hit people, you can be injured, you can be paralyzed, or you could die. And uh, and if the if the player doesn't read that warning or take heed of it, then you know. I don't know what else to say. I mean, you, you got to pay attention to that kind of stuff and not hit with your head. Yeah, for me, it's uh, uh, there. There was a lot of cringing in that game on uh, on Monday night, but yeah, it. Uh, I every time I see a hit to the head, I think of the time that uh, I was playing soccer and I had there was a goalie that you know he was running. I dove for a I dove for a ball and I just took his knee. He was running full speed, took his knee to the side of my head. Remember, I'm playing soccer. I don't have a helmet on, and that hurt like hell. So I can only imagine what it feels like with these guys who are loaded up with pads, have helmets, and they're running full speed, you know, world-class athletes, and they're taking each taking each other out at the head. And, uh, I mean, that's not getting your bell rung. That's getting your, you know, brain scrambled. And, um, you know, it's just... It, it's not good for the game. Uh, that's not what it should be about. You know, I think uh, to get to the Shazier point, I think that play uh, highlights, you know, one of the biggest problems in the NFL on the defensive side of the ball, which is, you know, in this era of, you know, with Madden, with the truck stick, and, you know, ESPN's jacked up phase, uh, all the stuff, uh, you know, they, pu- they emphasize hitting, over tackling. I remember, you know, growing up playing football, uh, youth football, and, you know, my dad played football back in the 50s, and so everything was like, you know, fundamentals, like this is how you tackle. There was never any hitting. Aim for the belt buckle and wrap them up. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's just changed, I think, and, you know, there's a lot of responsibility to be had. You know, certainly the players have to take care of each other. But it's a coaching issue, you know, at all levels of the game, from youth to to the pros. They've got to emphasize, you know, the the safe way to, you know, play defensive football. And, um, you know, I get it that, you know, there's times when, you know, you have a receiver coming over the middle and there's a throw and maybe your only option is to, to go high and try to break up the pass. But, you know, it, it, there's there's other circumstances, you know, the Juju Smith block, you know, I've heard that referred to as a, as a football play, but that wasn't a football play. It's a blindside hit. Um, and he, he was, knew what he was he, doing. He was knew he knew what he was doing. He went out of his way to do it. And then he gloated. stood stood over and him. Then stood over him. And he you gloated. Know, you can say all you want about that being a football Disgraceful. play. Disgraceful. That wasn't a football. It should have been an ejection. I agree. It yeah. should have been an ejection and a suspension. That that's absolutely Although it was garbage. It was definitely the latter, but right. I I think that you know. Since we're since we're treading into that, you know that's that's where this has to be. And you know the NFL has sent mixed messages. In the past, they've said referees they have the discretion; they can eject players for for hits like this. But clearly, the referees aren't getting that message because the referees aren't doing that, and the referees don't want to be in the position to say we're going to decide a game by kicking out you know a top player if they you know make a hit to the head. So. Justin, I was going to say that you know you have a hockey background. When you have two teams that are about to play each other and there's bad blood between them, the ref usually speaks to both coaches and says, "Hey, look, I don't want anything anything going on. No retaliation. No, you know, I want a you know good, clean game here. I don't want to see the bad blood come back, or you know, we're going to start. You know, the refs are going to start taking control of the game. And I think that's what happens with the NFL. The refs lose control of the game. I think." If someone lays somebody out, if there's a if there's a history, and the God knows the Bengals and Steelers have a, a very lengthy history now, the referees need to tell the coaches before the game, look, if any of your guys do this, cheap shots or anything, they're automatically gone. And then the coach needs to tell his players, like, look, if you do this and you're ejected, I'm a, I'm gonna suspend you for the next game. I'm gonna bench you for the next game. So if you wanna let your team down by trying to get revenge or trying to do something like that, then you're going to cost yourself a game check, and you're going to cost your teammates your services. 
Because this is, it's, I mean, that was just a disgrace, that game on Monday night. It was, it was an absolute disgrace. And I'm telling you, someone's going to get killed one of these days. It's only a matter of time. Someone's going to get killed. Yeah, I think um, just, you know, going back, you know, I, I, played, I played high school hockey. Um, I was fortunate enough to be, to be a captain for, for my senior year. And this is like any other high school sport. Um, the captains meet with the officials before the games. And, you know, they're just kind of, you know, you say hello and, and all that, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, the refs, which they really should say this every game, but they say, like, listen, you know, we're we're gonna call we're gonna call it tight tonight. We're not gonna let any of the crap, you know, after the whistle or any of that kind of stuff behind the play. We're not gonna let that go. And some refs will establish in the first couple minutes of the game, this is what's gonna get called, and this is what's not gonna get called. So, um, is there a way to do that in, in football when you know you're gonna have two teams that really don't like each other? Like, hey, listen, you know, one, you know. We're going to establish in the first quarter this is what's going to be flagged and this is what isn't. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't help when you have a Monday night game and uh, John Gruden and Sean McDonough are complaining after every flag that's thrown. Yeah. So how, how, how do refs take control of the game? Is it, is it ejections? I think it is. I think that's the only way you get the point across I, to these guys. I, I bring up, you know, a couple, couple weeks ago and same week we had uh, the A.J. Green yep. uh does the the choke slam thing on Jalen Ramsey? Uh, those two get ejected. They don't get suspended the next game. Right. Then you have uh, the same week the Buccaneers were playing the Saints, and Jameis Winston starts stirring up some stuff with uh, the Saints cornerback there, mm-hmm. Lattimore, and Mike Evans just comes totally out of frame and <laughs> smack yeah. crushes him. He doesn't get ejected, but he gets suspended the next game. So it's, it, I mean, it's like with any sport, you, you just would like to see it be consistent. Um, with with the officiating and how they try to do it, and yeah, you know, Chris, if 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 you have to eject a player, whether they're a star player or not, to say, hey, we're not going to take this crap, then then maybe they should. Um, w- would you guys? And I, I guess we'll we'll kind of go into the next topic of the Rob Gronkowski, uh, another wrestling move. Um, Preparing on Trey, for his future career. <laughs> yeah, well, probably is, but his little uh, thing with Trey White of the Bills. Um, what would you guys think of the suspensions? Because obviously uh, Smith Schuster was suspended a game. Uh, Ioka was suspended a game. I don't know if his got rescinded or not. I can't I, remember. I, I, Ioka's did, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, 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 they, they uh, reduced his to a fine. Well, not a fine, but a fine. And then Gronkowski got suspended a game. Right, um, they upheld that one. Yeah, yeah. so I, what would you guys think? I guess, Robert, first off, what would you think of the of the Gronkowski play? And then both both you guys, what you think of the suspensions? Well, when I when I first saw it, you know, in live action, I thought, well, maybe he he saw, you know, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I'm, look, I'm a Bills fan, but, uh, you know, I've, I've always liked Gronk. Uh, he's one of the few Patriots I like. And, uh, you know, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I was like, well, maybe he didn't see, because, you know, it, if you watch the play live, you see a Patriot touch him, you know, touch him down after the interception. And then Gronk comes in, and, you know, you can tell that he hits him up high. And it's like, well, you know, looked a little cheap, but maybe he didn't see. But then you see the the kind of like the end zone view, and you tell that, you know, he was looking right at the play. It was just a deliberate, dirty, cheap shot. And, um, you know, it. there's no place in the game for that stuff. It's uh, uh, It is different. Uh, I, I will give the players, you know, some leeway in the fact that it is different than, say, a cheap shot in the form of a block that's, you know, during the play or a hit to the head during the course of play. This is a deliberate act after the play's over. That player is laying on the ground, and you're going for his head. And he, you know, fortunately he's out of concussion protocol, but he could easily have ended up worse. You know, you never know. When and he, stuff he like said that. as much. Yeah, you're talking about Gronk, who weighs easily probably like 60 pounds more than he does is solid muscle one of the you know one of the biggest freak athletes the nfl has coming down on your head and neck area i mean that not too much not too many good things can happen out of that so um i i do think that the nfl should have come down harder on him of course you know with the current framework i don't know what the limitations are but i think that's something they need to explore these you know these dirty plays they did come down hard on Vontez perfect earlier this year, you know maybe Gronk's lack of a history. Well, that's affected a thing. Yeah, that. it's history. But you know, still should, should it be? I, I don't think so. I I, I think it. Well, I'm I th- you know I, I do think that 
you know, your history certainly, if you're a repeat offender, you know, obviously they they should. But I think in the moment when you look at that play and you look at the fact that he clearly, there's, a, there's no accident involved there. He clearly did this intentional. I think you have to take that in consideration and, make, I, and hand down a severe penalty. I think if Gronk had a history, I think the suspension would have been at least two or three games. But because it's his first offense and because it was so serious, that's why they gave him the suspension. I think if that if that hit wasn't as bad as it, as it was, it might have, he might have got away with just a fine possibly. Mm-hmm. But because it was so egregious... And after the play, uh, that's why he got the suspension. So I think the NFL on that situation handled it properly. So I also think if he doesn't hit him in the head, he doesn't get suspended. Well, that's well, that's the other. That's thing the too. only reason yeah. that they that they yeah. came down hard on is that White ended up in concussion protocol. Yeah, right, and that's so. the thing. I mean, that's what everybody's harping on is like you know these NFL players are having all these concussions and they have CTE and you know so yeah the NFL handled this one the right way. I mean, you know, Chris, obviously you've been watching football a lot longer than, than Robert and I have, so is... Also. is <laughs> wasn't even trying to make an old joke, but I, I mean, when you're watching the games, do you, do you notice any sort of difference between the physicality of today's NFL compared to what it I, was in the 90s and 80s and oh, 70s? I, I, I've said that maybe we should get together and watch an old game on YouTube on a TV and actually watch the game, like a regular game like it was broadcast, and see if you guys notice anything different. But I think for me, I think the thing that I see more than any other is just the, we talked brought this briefly at the beginning is tackling has changed so much because it used to be you, you try to wrap the guy up and take him down. And now it's like you just try to hit him so hard he falls down. And what happens is sometimes the guy can either dodge the hit or he takes the hit and doesn't knock him down and he keeps on going. Now, that being said, I do see a good number of players in the NFL today that still use proper tackling techniques. They do go for the legs, the wrap-up, especially running back. You'll notice that they, if, if a running back is, is behind the line of scrimmage, usually you see the defender try to wrap him up. Um, but I think after a guy catches a pass or a running back gets into the open field, that's when you try to see the hitting and everything. And, and you know, I, I don't. I think the game has changed in some ways, and I think in others it remains the same. I mean, look, there were more egregious cheap shots back in the day. I mean, they, 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 if you look at an NFL films production, you know, you see some of these hits. I mean, Jack Tatum. I mean, these were just absolute. I mean, Jack T- Tatum crippled Daryl Stingley in a preseason game. Yeah, that's the crazy thing. I mean, that hit came in a preseason game that did not mean anything, and 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 Jack Tatum. Is trying to lay out Daryl Stingley in that. I mean, that I mean, it was bad back in the day, but I, I think in other ways it's worse now because I think you do see more of these some of these feuds between teams where you know you, you know Bengal Steelers there's going to be there's going to be trouble. Raven Steelers, you know there's going to be hard hits, um, and I think the NFL needs to put a stop to this because these players are literally I would say they're killing themselves, but they're hurting themselves. I mean. It's sad. Like I said, you can play a hard, clean game of football and not try to maim or injure your opponent. So I think we need to watch a game together someday, guys. Like a Dolphins-Bills game, circa late 70s, uh, early 80s, yeah. Oh. Well, do you want to watch good football? or <laughs> That was good football, by the way. That was one side. The Packers, I got news for you. Back then, the Packers were yeah, like, they were... nobody was a Green Bay fan back then. If you were a Green Bay fan yeah, uh, you're, you're right. in the yeah. 70s or the early 80s, they were bad. 80s, they, you were uh, a Lombardi holdover. It, it okay? was, uh, it was Siberia. Green my dad, my dad was a Green Bay fan because he loved Lombardi in the '60s. So, yeah. uh, I was, I was listening to a podcast. This is kind of get back into the, the tackling and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, I was listening to a podcast and a former running back uh, Maurice Jones Drew was on it. Mm-hmm. And they were talking about the the games this weekend and, and the Steelers and Bengals. And I know it's it's kind of a popular opinion now that um, that kids. When you're when you're playing youth football, that you shouldn't be doing tackle football until you get to a certain age because your your body you know you're you're, you're act, uh, adding too many net unnecessary hits on on young players who aren't high school aren't ready for it. Yeah. Um, Jones Drew made the point that those extra years of playing youth football when you're younger make a huge difference in terms of just getting that experience on how to tackle when the game is a little slower, so that like your your brain. And your eyes are just trained better 
um, as opposed to learning in learning in high school when you're just way way past that point. Um, so I guess I'll go from that to this. Uh, you know, Robert, you and I don't have kids. Uh, Chris, you have two daughters. You don't have any sons. But where where would you stand on if if you had boys to allow them to play football and when you would allow It'd them to be, play football? It, I mean, first of all, it would be their decision. I mean, it would be if they were. If they were in middle school age and they wanted to play modified football, it'd be their decision. In high school, again, it would be their decision. I mean, look, I played one year of football in high school, and um, I loved it. I mean, I mean, I was the smallest, slowest guy on the team, but I had so much fun. <laughs> I, I did. I mean, we had a good group of guys, and I had so much fun that year. And um, and the practices were, I mean, they were, you know, you, you got hit. We used to have this thing called bull in the ring every week. The last practice with pads, we would have this drill or this thing called bull in the ring where we, the whole team would form a circle and the coach would call one person's name and that person would run out to the middle of the ring and then he'd call out another name and that guy would come charging and we would just be blasting each other, sh- you know, shoulder pads to shoulder pads for a couple of minutes till the coach said no more. And, and I'll tell you this, seriously, now I played football 35 years ago. There was one uh, bull in the ring where he called out one guy and then he called out another guy. The collision was so violent where both got both of them went, f- like they hit each other and they went backwards flying. If you ask anybody who played on that 1982 Auburn High football team who those two guys were, you say bull in the ring, they will remember those two guys, their, their name. I'm not going to mention their names on the podcast here, but they will, they will know their names. Absolutely, and, I'll, I'll, and someday we'll be out or something. We'll run into somebody, and I'll, I'll prove it to you. I'm serious. We remember there's those names 35 years later. I, I mean, we had a, re, a high school reunion back in the mid-'90s, and I got a photo of the two guys. You know, hey, when I see these two, you know, hey, you know, it's these two guys. Hey, you know, bull in the ring. You know, we, we reminisce about that. But looking back on it now, I mean, I don't think there's any way a coach would, would, would be doing stuff like that. No way. But back then, we reveled in it. We celebrated. Like, yeah, we laid, and I laid out so and so. I remember one time I got called in, and the coach was fair. I mean, he he would try to. Um, he wouldn't put you up against a defensive line. Yeah, he would put me. He wouldn't put me up against like a really huge guy. He would try to keep keep it even. Although one time he did put me up against one of our better players. Not a huge huge guy, but the guy probably had about fifty pounds on me. And he just like literally just you know because of his size advantage just knocked me all over the place. <laughs> Okay, not on the ground. I was staying. I was staying upright, by the way. But but anyways, I just I can't see so you that. You got to feel what, what Jay Cutler feels like. On there the sun you go. Wow. All right. <laughs> so anyways, I, I don't see that everything. But I would let if my sons wanted to getting back to if my sons wanted to play football, I would enc- I would encourage them. I'd say, yep, if you want to do it and you want to go through the physical part of the game and getting in shape and lifting weights and being strong and, and playing the game and you want to do it. Knowing the risks that you know you can get hurt seriously, concussions, I'd say, yeah, go ahead and do it. I, I couldn't because I did it myself. My my dad played high school football for three four years in the in the late fifties, early sixties, and he never pushed me to play football, you know. But I wanted to play on my own, and he supported my decision and and said, yeah, this is what you're going to have to expect, and you know, be prepared. and And he was right, and. I couldn't do that to my own children. If I had sons, there's no way I would prevent them from playing tackle football. I, would, I wouldn't say you have to do it or force them to do it, but if they wanted to do it, I would give them my blessing. Now, my wife, on the other hand, she might, she might say no. She might not want them to do the it. The voice of reason. But, I mean, I but that's what, but, you know, there's a lot of families that, you know, the, the parents, you know, I'll give you Don Shula. When he played high school football at, um, in Painesville, Ohio, back in the 1940s, his mom didn't want him to play because it was violent. So he forged his parents' signature on the permission slip, and the mother never knew that until I think maybe late in his senior year that he was playing high school football. I mean, it was even back then there was there was concerns about safety and stuff. So lovely. Mm-hmm. I would not let my sons play. I. Uh... I actually made the decision not to play football when I was a kid, and it wasn't, you know, my, uh, I remember there was a youth football league, and a lot of my friends were 
signing up and I was kind of interested in it. I played some flag football the year before, organized flag football for uh, the local Y. And I was thinking about it and uh, my parents were like, you know, what, you know, why don't you think about it some more and, you know, go from there. And uh, it was around the time uh, that a movie about Dennis Bird came out. Yeah, and the jet player. The jet player, yeah. Jet defensive end. He went to sack uh, uh, Dave Craig, quarterback of the Chiefs, in a preseason game and collided with one of his teammates. Uh, I think they collided helmet to helmet or he went helmet into sternum or something and he was paralyzed. Um, he uh, he uh, was able to regain the ability to walk again, but, um, you know, certainly frightening. And, uh, you know, that kind of... Uh, made up my mind for me uh you know the head the head trauma wasn't an issue so much then as it is now but uh i if i if i had sons i i would absolutely discourage it i you know i i get the parents you know like chris and you know even even my mom says you know you want to encourage your kids to do things you don't want to discourage them but to me the the costs outweigh the benefits you know the the odds that they'll make it big and pro are slim to none. The odds that they could get injured, you know, <laughs> are probably right on par with that, if not worse. So, um, I I think that the the costs, you know, we're we're learning so much more about football these days. Aaron Hernandez with the level of CTE that he had, and he was only in the NFL a few years. You know, he played football basically his entire life from youth to pro so um i just uh, to me that's your health is paramount and uh i i wouldn't that that'd be one of the few exceptions where i would say no this is where i exercise my parental veto power and say you're not going to play this is the the risks are too high especially the way that the game is played and the lack of um good instruction that's given at all levels of the game and it's just not safe it's just not safe and you know we see the the impact of it uh you know these guys who are legends of the nfl who uh uh you know can't even remember their own names some days and you know do you really want to end up like that well a couple guys i remember specifically from the uh, 85 bears Mm -hmm. uh refrigerator perry he's He's a total mess. I don't know. They did a special on. He, I think it was ESPN yeah. a few years ago, on him, and he can't even. Yeah. You know, he can't even move from his his uh, recliner. Right. And uh, you know, uh, Jim McMahon has made a few more public appearances, but he's not in great shape either. And there's count, countless other players uh, if they're still alive. Right. That Dave, Dave Dwierson was on that team. Yeah. Who committed uh, suicide. Who committed suicide? Right. So it's it's uh, for me personally, it's it's definitely something that I. Well, I will struggle with when the day comes for me when I have kids who, not just not just football, but want to play other collision sports. You know, yeah. football, hockey. Uh, you know, you you mentioned you played you played soccer, mm-hmm. and um, it's you know concussions happen in soccer too with yeah, kids the kids I, banging heads. So I had I had, I can tell you that I probably had at least uh, two or three concussions from playing soccer uh, to to varying degrees. The the one I mentioned the story with the knee to the head that was that was the worst, but. You know, there's a couple other times when, you know, you could head the ball wrong, you bang heads with a player, and, you know, it, it rings your bell and it stays with you. And, you know, later that night you're like, wow, you know, a little woozy or whatever, and you bounce back from it. But, you know, it's it definitely isn't just a football thing either. You know, not to, you know, obviously this is an NFL podcast, but, um, you know, it's something that a lot of the contact sports, uh, I think more and more, you know, we see it in hockey, uh, soccer less so, but it, it should be a conversation there as well about uh, uh, about the, the impact of uh, repetitive head trauma and, uh, you know, what that does later in life. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I think a, a lot of sports will have to wrestle with. Uh, the NFL's dealing with it now and certainly into the future, but you know, other sports aren't immune for it. Uh, immune from it, that's for sure. I do. I, I will add. I, I do feel it's like almost a sense of like it's just, it's a weird feeling because like I like I just said, I would I really have a tough tough call 
allowing my kids to play football, and yet I love watching football. I love talking football, obviously, because we're here doing it. So it's like, you know, I, I wouldn't allow my kids to do it, but here I am I'm sitting on the couch every Sunday drinking beers and, you know, right. favorite day of the week because I get to sit down and watch my team and watch other people put put their health at risk. It's, you know, we're, we're it's yeah. tough tough balancing act. So I mean, I lucked out. I didn't have to make that decision. I mean... You know, I, I, I still wonder if I had had boys instead of girls. You know, I say, oh, yeah, I'll let them play. But, I mean, if I actually had to make that decision, would I change my mind? But, again, my dad played, I played, I, you know, and, I, and I, I understand. Like, I say, oh, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Um, but, you know, like I said, I would say if they want, my boys wanted to play, I'd let them play. All right, so we're, we're at about the half an hour mark right now, so I don't want to I don't want to stay on this too long because we did we talked about it a little bit last week. But uh, since the last podcast, uh, the Giants put on another pathetic performance. Decided to fire both Ben McAdoo and uh, General Manager uh, Jerry Reese. Just you got your guys' quick thoughts on on the decisions. And uh, I'm assuming you you know Chris said they probably should be fired last week. So yeah, I I, I think it was a week. Well, actually, I, I think in the case of Reese, it was a few years too late. That guy was a joker as a general manager. How he lasted this long is beyond me. I remember having conversations with the the late Kristen Wolford about this, and you know we would I would joke with her that uh, uh, they should can Tom Coughlin, you know, and move on. And but in all seriousness, I would say you know who who, who they really have to get rid of is Jerry Reese because he's garbage. It's terrible, and uh, you know it's about time that they did that. And you know, it took uh, an embarrassment uh, with the whole Eli Manning fiasco for them to, re- for the owners to realize that, gee, you know, we look pretty bad here. Yeah, no kidding. Well, so they finally took action. You know what the Giants did? You know what the Giants did? This is what they did. Took your advice? Hold on. No. Hold on. Uh, Chris has got something dialed up here. There we go. Hold what are you on. doing? What the, are you The listeners are okay. waiting anxiously. we go I'm, I'm sure <laughs> i'm sure that'll come across greatly they, on the podcast they flushed that. him out <laughs> they flushed him out he yeah. queued up a flush <laughs> wow yeah i'm multi-talented rob you're not the only person who can do amazing things with the well uh, you didn't warm up the room with your hot takes but you no, flushed the no, podcast sorry. down the drain so Look, I'll, I'll yeah so there we go anyway all right so uh yeah, you know, I almost feel a little bit bad for Jerry Reese because... Fake news. No, well, think about it. This is a guy who did draft Odell Beckham Jr. I mean, he did well, find a gem Even there. a blind squirrel gets a nut here. Right, there come we on. go. I give you that, but... Uh, Except for the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. Yeah, Sammy Watkins, who's actually doing pretty darn good now for them, yeah, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. Uh, and because he's healthy. Uh, anyway, so, you know, I, I feel bad for, for Reese because, you know, like I said, the, the guy... Has done some successful. He's been. He's got a track record of be, of having some success. Okay. They were eleven and five last okay. year. Okay. Um, but obviously, a lot of things snowballed this year, and you know, I think the Mara family they just sensed that their fans were very upset and they wanted a complete house cleaning, and they decided to push the button and uh, not just get rid of McAdoo, but get rid of Jerry Reese. And I feel a bad for Reese. I think maybe that um, he deserved maybe another year to try to turn things around, but but McAdoo had to go. And, you know, I, I was reading an article on Bleacher Report, and this was interesting. It's like the guy was writing that the uh, the that a lot of these guys who get head coaching jobs in the NFL, the reason why they're getting these jobs is because they're, like, associated with, like, a, a certain quarterback. Like, you know, like McDaniels in, in New England, you know, with mm-hmm. Tom Brady or – McAdoo in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, Joe Philbin in, in Miami with, with Aaron Rodgers. I mean, there's a lot of coaches that had coaches that got their job because, oh, well, he's coming from this system and everything, and that, that team is successful. Adam and, well, yeah, you could, and he makes that point too. Yes, Adam Gase, <laughs> yes. I'll admit it. Uh, but, of course, Adam Gase has made the playoffs one time in two years, hey. given that. What did I just say about blind squirrels and nuts? Yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Uh, Mr. I have not made the playoffs since the Clinton administration in the last millennium, but we'll win. You know. Hey, those were the good old days. Don't you forget it. Flutie Flakes? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Anyways, um, so, uh, you know, McAdoo, I think you could argue, like, how did this guy get this job? I would love to, I'll be honest with you, I would love to sit in on an interview for a head coach in the NFL and the questions they asked them. 
you know, how do you handle the roster? How do you handle players? How do you, you know, how do you handle game management? How do you handle the media? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think what, what we get away from sometimes, and this article does mention this, because I don't want to make a look up and rip this guy off, but, but coaching should actually mean coaching. Like, coaching to me, and it, it means making a player better. Taking a player who has some talent and making him even better. Okay, Fund- you can talk about fundamentals, you can talk about technique, but you know, taking a guy who's got raw talent and coaching him so he's better. And I think in the NFL today, and I think a part of it's because the practices are shorter and different things, but we don't see as much good coaching. Players who get better as time goes along. I don't think we see that as much as we used to. I think I think a lot of a lot a lot of Dolphin fans especially. They expect a rookie to come in and, and be a star right off the bat. And that's, that just doesn't happen very often in the NFL where a, a fifth-round pick comes in and, and just lights it up. Or even a first-round pick, like Charles Harris, the Dolphins' first-round draft pick, the defensive end out of Missouri. He's only got one sack. That's it. And people are saying, like, well, um, geez, the Dolphins really messed up that first-round draft pick. Be- because he's not, he doesn't have ten sacks his first season. I mean, it t- I think it takes time to make the adjustment from the college game to the pro game, but also, is the coaching good enough? Is, are the Dolphins coaches, or any NFL coaches, are, they, are these guys good enough that they're coaching their, their players where these guys are improving because, hey, a coach showed me a new technique or something on how to you know, become, get free out of a block and get to the quarterback, or a coach taught me a technique on how to like, defend the pass better. I don't think we're seeing as good tech teaching coaching, I guess is what I'm trying to say, in the NFL today. Chris, it really... It it pains me to my core to, to have to give you credit, but I, I do think I think you're onto something. Um, you know, Bill Bill Belichick is is famous for being the one coach in the NFL where yes, he, he is the head coach, but he could go any any day he could go to, over to a position coach, say, get out of the way, I'm gonna coach this mm-hmm. this group today and he'll 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 know everything. And I think you know, you kinda touched on it, but um, you know, a lot of these coaches that are being being hired now are being hired because because of a system they came from. Yeah. Like you mentioned, uh, Joe Philbin and Ben McAdoo were both great examples of that. So, and really, maybe it's because all these teams have so many assistant coaches. Each position group has its own coach. That a head coach doesn't really. How much actual coaching do they get around to? You know, yeah. when they're not just game planning. Uh, I don't know. So yeah, Chris, you you might be onto something there. I will add in uh, Ben McAdoo's case and Philbin's, yeah, they got, uh, as a Packers fan, they got taken to, with their new jobs, to kind of use the Mike McCarthy system. Well, the Mike McCarthy system, as a Packers fan, I will honestly say is completely outdated and only works because of the quarterback. Yeah, have, and, that's, so. and that's the thing. I mean, you're getting the coach, but you're not getting the quarterback. I mean, Or, or the, the roster. Right. So Big difference. Who knows? I mean, but... Yeah, I think we'll uh, I think we'll wrap up there unless you guys have something else you want to add or something you're excited about uh, this weekend. Nothing. Dolphins gonna shock the world Monday night. No, I'm just no, I'm just kidding. Fake news. I'd love to see. Oh, I would love to see that though. You know, the Dolphins do have a history of playing New England tough on Monday night games. No right? Gronk. Well, I don't think this game. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I the the Patriots do pretty well without Gronk. He gets hurt a lot, so I think that that's not really going to be a factor here. I mean, it, you know, he caught two TD passes against Miami two weeks ago, but. That's not going to be a factor. I mean, for Miami to have any chance, and I'm, you know, we'll talk about it later in our video. But I mean, you literally have to play a mistake-free game, and I just don't think that team is capable of it. So, and I just that's just to have a chance of hanging around. A team led by Jay win. Cutler play mistake-free. Yeah, wow. I know that would be breaking news. Mm-hmm. Yes, it would be. Are you Are you guys excited to come back next week and discuss the return of the greatest quarterback in football? <laughs> I thought he was going to say, "Are you guys excited to talk about?" The Dolphins playing the Bills, man. Our 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 no, rivalry is, that. Is, that is renewed. Oh, I'm excited. Pete Peterman versus Cutler. I love beating Buffalo. I don't care. Yeah, they should. Flex. I don't care if each team was 0 and 13 going into this game. I don't care, man. If it was 0 and 13, they should flex it to it, Sunday night because yeah. that would be a barn burn. Oh yeah, it would be. But well, yeah. the joke would be on the Dolphins who would win, and the Bills would end up getting the quarterback they need in the draft. Exactly. But they've already got him, Peterman. That's the dude, man. Nate Peterman. That's not the dude. He, that's nothing. How do you I mean, know? Robert's been out on Peterman since the <laughs> one, preseason. One start. Oh, let's get rid of him. All right. All right you want to wrap right. it up, guys? Yep. We'll close up shop there. Uh, for Robert Harding and Chris Shearer, this is Justin Ritzel 
spent another edition of the Citizen NFL Podcast.